Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Hey, if you're new here, my name's Stephen, and we're glad that you're here, and we have a special treat. You know, as many of you know, we launched a campus in Sandy Springs back in a pandemic, like, why not, right? So in October of 2020, we sent some leaders down there, and so um, we have a campus down in Sandy Springs, and one of the things that makes us a campus is that we always teach the same series and the same topics at the same time, and so um, today we have a special treat to have our lead pastor from our Sandy Springs campus, someone who had taught here many, many times up until two years ago and hasn't taught here since then. Uh, Joey McLaughlin is in the house today. And so Joey is not a guest. Joey is a son of Stone Creek, and so really glad to have him back, Jack. So come on, Joey. Come on up here. Let's give him a warm Stone Creek welcome. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Um, as Stephen said, it's been two years, and just want to give you guys a little life update. I am still married to the most gorgeous girl on the planet, in case you were wondering. Uh, we have uh, three children. Now we just had one. Now we have three. So we've got Raleigh Ray, Haddon Crew, and Lainey Lee. And if those aren't the most adorable Southern names you've ever heard in your life, then you can go back to California or New York or wherever you came from, Okay. Um, I want you guys to know that things are going incredibly well at Elevate City. Things are really blowing up down there. Uh, deep discipleship is happening. Uh, redemption stories are happening every single week. New people are coming every single week. Um, I don't know if you're ready for this. Last week alone, 18 people gave their life to Jesus for the very first time. And that's our church, okay? Like, we are one church that meets in multiple locations. When you give here, you are sowing in not just to this campus, but to all of our campuses. And so from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you for not keeping Stone Creek to yourself. Thank you for believing in gospel-centered multiplication because you are waking a generation up to the greatness of Jesus Christ. Um, I would be remiss if I got on this stage and didn't have a little bromance moment. And so can we honor our pastor, Stephen Gibbs, for the 22 years that he's been investing at Stone Creek Church. God has done such a powerful work through his life here. He's done such a powerful work in my life through Stephen. I'm a better dad because of you, a better man because of you, a better husband because of you. My abs look great because of your core program, Okay. <laughs> And uh, so I'm just so grateful for the deposit that you've made in my life. I've learned so much from you. But one thing that I've yet to learn from you is how to preach a sermon in 40 minutes. So let's get this show on the road, okay? Let me uh, pray for us, and then we'll get started. Some of y'all are nervous. You should be. All right, here we go. Let's pray. Jesus, I love you, and I am beyond grateful for what you have done through this church in my life and in this community over the last 22 years. But God, I just... Stand here eagerly, expectant today, believing that you're nowhere close to being done yet, and believing that you have so much more in store for us. God, from the bottom of my heart, I want people to get this word that I believe that you have in store for them today. I don't have words to explain or to accurately describe how deeply I want this for people today. God, I just forbid this being another church service that's just going through the motions of a religious experience and leaving here as normal. This is not a show or a production. This is your word, your living word that can jump off of the pages and into our life. And so, God, I can't do it today. I can't be clever enough or passionate enough or funny enough, but your Holy Spirit working and moving. You tell us in your word, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And so I just pray that your spirit would, would fill us today, would open our eyes, would open our hearts, and it would lead us into a new way to be human. I pray for it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, Luke 24, Luke 24, um, I want for you to know that we're going to be in a lot of scripture this morning. If you love the Bible, then you're going to love today because you're going to be like, I don't even know if that dude preached. I just feel like he read a lot of verses, okay? Like it, that, that didn't seem very hard. I hope we didn't pay him for that. Um, but we're going to be in a lot of scripture today, okay? Because um, God has started to show me some things through his word, some things that maybe I knew about intellectually but didn't know about experientially. Um, as I've read the scriptures 
preparing for this series. I just want for you to know in total transparency, in 14 years of teaching the Bible, I've never spent as much time or energy or effort preparing for a series like I have this one. I've never been in the lab as much. I've never read as many books or taken as many classes or watched as many se seminars. And I've never been as intellectually engaged. But even beyond that, I've never been as emotionally engaged. I've never been as spiritually moved as I have preparing for this. Like you could ask my wife and my team, like there's just, God is doing something different on my insides and I really want for you to get it today. And I want for you to know that it comes from his word. I feel a little bit like that old Native American legend. I don't know if you know the story or not, but there was this old Native American whose tribe was from the mountains and he made the journey to the Pacific Ocean for the very first time. And I don't know if you can remember that first time that you saw the ocean. We kind of lived near the coast, and so we went when we were little kids. But if you could imagine and never seeing it and making the journey through the mountains to it, when this Native American saw it, it was a sight to behold. And he said that he saw it, was in awe of it, went down into it, and begun to wade in the waves. And as he did, he took with him this little clay pot and he started to fill this little clay pot up with water from the Pacific Ocean. And it was just bubbling over and somebody turned to him and said, what are you doing? And he said, my people are from the mountains and they've never made it to the great waters. And so I wanna take some of it back with me to show them what it's like so that they can experience it for themselves. Now, let me ask you, do you think that that Native American showing his people some salty water in a little clay pot could ever accurately describe for them the experience of seeing the ocean for the very first time? No way, not in a million years. And in total honesty, that's how I feel today. I feel like I'm trying to explain something that is vast and that is immeasurable and capture something that I've experienced. And I feel like I've just got this little clay pot today and some salty water that I'm just trying to pour out and let you experience it and see what it's like. And so I approach today with a level of humility, knowing that I feel like I'm trying to fit the Pacific Ocean into the little clay pot of 40 minutes together on a Sunday morning. And so with that being said, let me try to show you what I feel like God has shown me in his word. Luke 24, I found something that I think that the church is missing. Then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Oh, if that would happen today. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Verse 48, you are my witnesses of these things and behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. Here it is, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Flip over to Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, just a, just a book over, verse eight. I'm gonna beat you there because I've got screens. <laughs> but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Flip, flip, flip over just one chapter, Acts chapter two. I love to hear those pages turn. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. One more chapter, go to Acts chapter three, Acts chapter three, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made 
him walk. Let's go Acts chapter 4. We're just going to keep on going. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and grace was upon them all. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power was doing great wonders and signs among the people. This is where it gets really crazy. This, I don't even think I knew this was in the Bible before. Acts chapter eight, verse 18 says this. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money <laughs> saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. And I could just keep going throughout the book of Acts and show you this, this thing that's happening, but let's just jump out of Acts so that you know that it's not just like one isolated book in the New Testament. Let's go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter two. So what it says, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom. I wasn't intellectual. I didn't communicate great strategy. I didn't have great innovation. I didn't uh, introduce something new, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. First Corinthians chapter four, verse 20 says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. First Thessalonians 1, 5 says, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in, you guessed it, power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Romans 15, verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Hope is impossible without this power. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And you should know this one, Ephesians chapter three, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. So let me ask you today, does that sound at all like the kind of life that you've been living or the kind of Christianity that you've been doing? If you were honest, and I know we're not supposed to be honest because we're in church, right? But if you were honest for just a second, is that what your life feels like? Do you feel like you're clothed in power, walking in power, marked by power, praying with power, healing in power, speaking with power, got bold power, energizing power? Is that how your life feels? Is that what your experience with God has been like? One of power. Okay, what if it could be? What if it was meant to be? What if it's got to be? I don't know about you, but I feel like there are way too many Christians living on life support in 2022. Way too many Christians who feel discouraged and defeated. They look at the news and the media and what's happening in culture and they just, they hang their heads low. I don't know about you, but do you ever... Do you ever look in the mirror and ask yourself like, what happened to me? And I don't mean like the gray hairs or the wrinkles, okay? Well, you know what happened there? The Greek word for it is children, okay? <laughs> but do you ever look in the mirror and go, where did my passion go? Where did the defiance go? Where did the desire for God even go? What happened to me? Do you, do you ever look at this book, read this book and wonder 
Why does it seem like the lives of these Jesus followers seem so different from my life? Because you know that the people in this book were people just like you and me, right? The people in this book were real people who had real jobs and they were raising kids and they were starting businesses and they were living under the tyrannical rule of a crazy government, not that we know anything of what that would be like. They were trying to make ends meet and they were trying to figure it out and yet they seemed to live with this power. They, they even had a crisis of faith. I don't know if you've ever had one where you kind of came to a crossroads moment and you asked yourself the question, I don't know if I can keep living this thing out. I don't know if I can keep walking down this road. I've got too many doubts and too many questions. Did you know they had one too? When Jesus died, the movement of Christianity seemed to come to a screeching halt. They doubted, they ran, they were locked behind a doors. They were out of the public sphere, but then something happened, something that changed everything. What Jesus promised came to fruition at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit showed up and he poured out and he empowered and he moved in and it changed everything. Now, some of you guys just hearing that word Pentecost makes you nervous because of the kind of church you grew up in, right? Like by show of hands, how many of you grew up Baptist by show of hands? How many of you grew up Catholic by show of hands? How many of you grew up Pentecostal? Yeah, you throw your hands way up in the air, right? You're like, here we are. But just hearing that word, Pentecost, can make you nervous, and I don't want for you to make you nervous. Like, I'm not today trying to communicate some exotic theology to you. I'm trying to tell you what is actually available to you based upon God and his word. Like if you would read the New Testament, you would see that it is clear that the authors did not envision this power as some random sporadic phenomenon. The story of the New Testament in the book of Acts is what it looks like as an everyday Christian when and only when, if and only if you live in the power of the Holy Spirit. I saw this A.W. Tozer quote this week that just absolutely wrecked me. It says, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we would do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everyone would know the difference. We live life we do church and Christianity in our own strength, in our own understanding, in our own intellect. I would contend today that's why it returns impotent and powerless and boring. I want for you to know today that there is something different that is available. It is not exotic theology. It is not sensationalism. I'm just trying to show you what the scripture says is available to you and me. First Peter chapter one, verse three says this, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I want for you to know this power isn't just for preachers like that word all in the Greek, it just means all, okay? Every bit of it. There's no power that was available to them that is not available to you and to me. I don't know what your background is theologically, but I'm telling you that if you were handed this book and you read it on an island and you came back, the one thing that you would conclude that they had in their life that seems missing from yours is the power of the Holy Spirit. And there would not be anything in this book that would lead you to indicate that that power isn't still available to you and me. We have this divine power for all things that pertain to life and godliness. It doesn't matter what area, whether it is intellectual power or spiritual power or emotional power or miraculous power, it is available to you and me. It's available, and I'm not talking Marvel. I'm not talking Star Wars today. I'm talking about real power, God, otherworldly, transcendent, supernatural power that's available to you and me, but that shows up in practical spaces in everyday life, like power to read the Bible and have it make sense. You can't read this without the power of the Holy Spirit. It won't matter to you without the power of the Holy Spirit. Reading the Bible without the Holy Spirit is really boring. Reading the Bible with the Holy Spirit is a joy that you can't get enough of. 
the power of the Holy Spirit. It gives you power to remember when you forget. I don't know if you have a tendency of forgetting like I do, but there are times that I just forget and I need to be reminded and like a missile from heaven, God will just send this scripture into my mind when I'm talking to somebody and all of a sudden I quote this scripture. I just say it to him. I don't even know where it came from. I don't even remember reading. I just say it to him like a missile from heaven. I gotta go back and like make sure that it's actually in there later on, you know? What did I just commit heresy? Like, is it? Because it's power, power to remember. I want for you to know that Christianity is going to be hopeless without the Holy Spirit. It's hopeless. Now, I coach lots of young pastors and teachers and preachers, and I, tell, I, I used to tell them all the time, you're never going to be able to preach without the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to every week because Sunday's always coming. It's like every preacher's got one good message, Okay. Everybody's got one. Do you have two, okay? And can you do it the, the next week and the week after that and the week after that? Because I don't know, but it's a lot. Like you don't pray for your pastor enough, okay? I'm just telling you, you need to pray for that man way more because every week he's got to get up here and monologue for 35 minutes, right? And he's got to be funny and interesting and insightful and wise and impart truth to you. And that's a lot of work and you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So I've always told these young preachers, you're never gonna be able to preach without the Holy Spirit. But now today I'm going, you can't go to Walmart without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> like you can't. You're not gonna be able to live. You're not gonna be able to breathe. You're not gonna be able to do marriage. You're not gonna be able to do parenting without the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has been given to you and to me to make Christianity that is empty and religious without it, but that is powerful and active and supernatural with it. There's this scripture in the Bible that's just been haunting me that says that there is this form of godliness that denies the power of God, avoid such people. Just God, far be it from me to ever be the kind of preacher person who ever falls into a form of godliness but denies the power of God. We're not playing religious games here. We're not talking about morality here. This is not a club. This is not for us to have good behavior. This is because the God of the universe sent his spirit inside of us to give us power, power to change the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says this, but where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is power available that brings freedom in your life. I don't know what you're caught up in. I don't know what sin you're entangled in. I don't know what obstacle is front in, in front of you. I don't know what stronghold is wrapped around you, but this power can break everything that is in front of you. Every addiction, every lust, every lie, every insecurity, every baggage from your past, there is power for freedom in your life. Do you want to stop being held back by those sins of your youth? Do you want to stop going back to those same broken cisterns that have run dry and that leave you empty. Tap in to the power of the Holy Spirit. There is power that brings freedom, power to transcend the finite limitations of your human experience and to do supernatural things. I'm telling you, every other power in this life will run out. You can eat all the kale and drink all the coffee you want. It's not going to be enough. We're talking about inexhaustible power. It says that God gives his spirit without measure, limitless power. I hate limits. I hate time limits. I hate speed limits. I hate limits. Okay, well, God gives his power without limit. You can't exhaust it. It never runs dry. You never get to the bottom of it. You never get bored with God when you understand the power of God. We're talking about the God who has Genesis 1 on his resume who spoke the creation into existence. What might he want to do in you and me? There's power to change the world. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. This power is about becoming. If you're taking notes, you should write that down, tweet it. You're going to need it, repeat it, okay, because... Power is about becoming. You have power to be my witnesses. You ever try to do witnessing? You ever try to share your faith? Well, this power isn't about doing. This power is about becoming, where it changes you from the inside out because by the Spirit of God, you're seeing the greatness of Jesus and you're just wanting to give testament to what you have seen. You become this bold witness power to say things that you never thought that you could say, to speak up in situations that you've remained silent, to shift your perspective and remind you that in the end, your reputation and your job and how people see you isn't gonna matter, but the kingdom of God certainly will. To remind you that in the end, that this gospel message needs to go out to all nations. 
and it gives you power to change the world, power to be witnesses. The Greek word here is dunamis, dunamis, and it's where we get our word for dynamite. It's explosive. It blows things up in your life. So I know you gotta be asking, well, where is it, Joey? Because I don't see it. Why don't I see it? Why don't I see this power of God? I want it. I mean, I really do. If it's available, I feel like I need that because I found myself stuck in some things that I would love to get out of. And I really want to believe the things in this book. I look around at this world and I gotta know that there's another world. I need some hope in my soul. I need to be able to make it through this thing called life. I'm, I'm suffocated by the nine to five. I wanna know if there's a new way to be human. So why don't we see the power? I can tell you one reason perhaps that we don't see the power of God at work in our lives. It's because we've engineered for ourselves lives where we do not even need it. We've allowed our money and our things and our stuff Technology and our modern day luxuries to create a life that is so insulated from needing God that we would never have to reach out and depend upon the spirit of God to provide for us. And I want for you to know that it's a veil. That yeah, you can make it through these 80 years on planet earth without the power of God, but you ain't stepping into eternity without it. You're gonna miss out on a whole lot of purpose you're gonna miss out on a whole lot of joy until you begin to see your great need for the power of God and begin to desire the power of God. Did you know that Jesus lived in the power of God? Jesus did not do life without the spirit of God. This is gonna blow your mind. Um, in Luke chapter one, verse 35, we see that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. This next part is like high level theology. So not only was Jesus conceived in the Holy Spirit, but Jesus, when he came to earth, laid aside his divinity. He didn't tap into his divine rights, into his godness. He became as human as you and me. Let me show you Philippians chapter two. Verse six, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now, make no mistake, Jesus was, is, and always will be God. There was never a moment when he wasn't God. I'm not playing games with Jesus' divinity. But when he came to earth, he emptied himself of that godness so that he could live just like you and me, fully dependent upon the spirit of God. Jesus knew he needed the spirit. Matthew chapter three, verse 16, we see that he's anointed by the spirit at his baptism. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with him, I am well pleased. At Jesus' baptism, he is anointed by the spirit and he is, he is then, he's filled with the spirit and he's led by the spirit into the wilderness. Watch this, this is so crazy. Luke chapter four. And then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness in the Bible is always the place of desperation. It doesn't matter if you look at Abraham or Moses or Elijah, when you go into the wilderness, it's the place of desperation, the place of need. So every time you see wilderness in the scriptures, think desperation. Because in that place of desperation, it moves you to a place of dependence and desire. And so Jesus is in the wilderness, in this place of desperation that moves him to a place of dependence and desire. And watch what, watch what happens in verse 14, Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And news of him went out through the surrounding region. He goes into the wilderness, the place of de desperation. He discovers this need for dependence and desire, and he walks out in power. I need you to know that before Jesus is baptized in the Spirit, before he is led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and then comes out in the power of the Spirit, there is no sermon Jesus preaches. There is no miracle Jesus performs. There is no disciple that Jesus makes. There is no ministry that happens, no life change that occurs, no famous sermon that gets communicated without the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But out of the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus stands up in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set liberty all who are oppressed in Jesus' name. In the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want for you to know that at the end of that sermon, the crowds look in at Jesus and they go, isn't this Joseph's son? <laughs> they saw a distinguishable difference between Jesus walking in the spirit and Jesus walking without the spirit. Even when it was the cross, even when Jesus' calling was the cross, the spirit gave him the ability to overcome it, not my will, but yours be done. So let me ask you today, look right at me. If the God of the universe, if Jesus Christ, the creator of all that is, knew that it was impossible to live life without the spirit, then why do you and I think we can do life in our own strength? If Jesus knew that he needed this power, was tapped in to this power, why do we think we're going to be able to make any difference or live a lick of Christianity without him? So how do we get it? How do we get the Holy Spirit? How do we be filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we walk in the Spirit? Because I'm telling you today that this is what's missing. This is what's missing from churches. I know what's missing from churches in America and why they're closing their doors. This is what's missing from marriages. This is what's missing from your Bible studies and your quiet time and your conversations with your neighbors. This is what's missing in your job. This is what's missing. So how do we get it? Let me draw your attention to Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding uh, regions. So Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be with God. Jesus comes out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit of God. It's going to blow your mind today. Time with God. Time with God. God. Do you know why Jesus had all God's power? Because God had all of Jesus' time. More power, more time. Less time, less power. No time, no power. We would love to microwave Christianity in the 21st century, but I'm here to tell you today that you can't. You just can't. It's impossible. There's no life hack that I can give you. There's no go around. There's no quick route. There's only a long way through in the wilderness, 40 days for Jesus of waiting on the Lord, of tarrying with the Lord, of being with the Lord. Time with the Lord is the place that power is found. This is as much a message about the presence of God as it is the power of God. I'm here to tell you today that I, I, in this last season, like my experience of the power of God has been remarkably different and my time in the presence of God has astronomically gone up. You cannot disconnect these things. There's no cheat code, there's no hack. It is time with God that produces the power of God. Jesus knew what I think you and I are so aware of and it's that power leaks, power leaks. We have this tendency of losing power of it, just like flowing out of us. Jesus knew it so well that there was that instance, if you remember the story, where the woman with the issue of blood came up to Jesus in a crowd and he's surrounded by all these people. It just looks like people kick a little ant pile on Jesus. People are all around him and this woman touches Jesus. And what does it say? Luke chapter eight, verse 46, Jesus said, someone touched me for I perceive that power has gone out from me. Jesus was so aware of his constant need to live in the power of God that when a little bit went out from him, he knew it. He knew it. He said, whoa, 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 where did that go? I needed that. I'm living in that. How aware are you of your need for the power of God? Jesus lives so aware. We live so unaware. Do you remember in Jesus' baptism, it said that the, the dove descended and remained on Jesus? Everyone knows that the dove descended. I want to draw your attention to that word remain. The dove remained on Jesus. Have you ever asked yourself, how, do you, how did Jesus get the dove to remain? Well, if you wanted a skittish little bird like a dove to remain on your soldier or shoulder, what would you do? 
you would take every step with the dove in mind. Every step you take, I need the Holy Spirit. Every breath you take, I need the Holy Spirit. I don't want to leave from your presence. I don't want to move from this moment. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I've got a dove on my shoulder. I'm aware of him. I'm tapped into him. I need the power that he provides. It's your time with God. I wish that I could give you some, like, cheat code. I wish that I could communicate to you some easy step plan, but it doesn't work like that. The power that you will experience will be in direct proportion to the amount of time you spend in God's presence. There is no other way. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, we see this pattern of power, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city. Until when? Until you are clothed with power from on high. You see, we give up so easily. We give in so quickly. I need you to know today that salvation is free. God loves you where you're at. His grace, total free gift. Intimacy, very costly. Very costly. For you to be close to God and know the nearness of God and experience the power and the presence of God, it's going to cost you something, namely your time. And as much as you give yourself to God is as much of himself that he's going to give back to you. If, if you were honest and you started to just kind of add up the math of the amount of time that you're spending in the presence of God and the amount of experience that you're having with the power of God, I think some of the dots would start to connect. I think you'd start to go, oh yeah, you're right. I say I wanna live in God's power and I say I wanna live in God's strength, but I sure seem to be doing a whole lot of this by myself. Ephesians gives us this warning. It warns us. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Aren't the days so evil? They're so evil. They steal so much time. They trick us into believing that these little extracurricular things matter and that I, I, can't, I don't have time for my devotion. I don't have time for prayer. I don't have time to be with the Lord. I have so much to do. And that's why you need it so badly. Because you have all of that to do, because there's so much activity to perform, because you've got to get your kids to a million different uh, events, because you know they're going to be the one who defies the odd and makes it to the major leagues. <laughs> and so because of that, you need this. You desperately, desperately need this. So the days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is and not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the language here is so beautiful. It's this idea of not just be filled, but be being filled. It's this idea that the Holy Spirit is not as much like a lake as he is like a river, one that flows into you and out of you and always needs to be filled again and again and again. The chief assignment of every believer is to daily be filled with the Spirit of God and then operate out of that power. I think far too many of us are living on the experience of younger years. I know I had been, if I'm honest, in younger years when I'd seen God move, younger years when I hungered to devour this word, younger years when I'd been in his presence and I would just let time pass away and evaporate and because there was no place truly that I'd rather be in. I'd, I've been trying to live on those younger years and something is like broken in me and where I've gone, I don't want to have a moment that I take a step that I'm not aware of this dove on my shoulder who wants to bring power and presence into my life, who wants to activate things in me, open my eyes to see, breathe afresh again. Philippians chapter three says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Would you love to know the power of Jesus' resurrection today? I don't know what your faith feels like. I don't know what Christianity feels like in your bones right now. I don't know, maybe if it feels cold. Maybe it feels stale, maybe it feels boring, maybe it feels religious, maybe it feels predictable. 
Wouldn't you love for your faith to be resurrected? Wouldn't you love for it to come to life again? Wouldn't you love for it to have vitality and meaning in your every day? Wouldn't you love to see a faith that changes you, how you talk to your kids and changes how you talk to your neighbor? Wouldn't you love to see a faith that makes you long for the things of the Lord, to believe the impossible again, to not be defeated by what's happening in our country or society, but to know that greater is he who is in us than he who lives in the world? Wouldn't you love that? To believe that God's best days of his kingdom are not behind us, but ahead of us. And you've got to count everything as a loss compared to knowing him. It's the only way, church. It's your choice today. It's not a question of whether or not you're going to get into heaven or not. It's whether or not heaven's coming to earth or not. That's the question today. Whether or not you're going to get to experience the powerful presence of God with you each and every day. And you're sleeping and you're breathing and you're working and you're talking. All the time, he's with you. And he's wanting to move. And he's wanting to open eyes. And he's wanting to bring transformation and healing and renewing. He's wanting to do a new thing. But will you get desperate for it? Will you get into the wilderness? Will you adopt a rhythm and a pattern to access this power that's available to you and to me, I'm praying that the move of God's spirit would pour out like it poured out in the book of Acts, that it would fill us like it filled the church of Corinth, that we would be people who are passionate, who know how to pray, who push back darkness, who love worship, who see miracles, and who see God's kingdom come. I'm praying for it. And listen, all of this may be brand new to you, and you're going, Joey, I know. This is wild. I need this. I'm here today, not on accident, but on purpose. because my life has felt empty and dry, and I need this power. And if that's you, this is what God's word says. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working in your heart right now to show you your need for a Savior. And I'm telling you, Jesus is that Savior. In the book of Acts, when Peter preached, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he said, listen, Jesus has come. He has died. God sent his son to get you back into relationship with him. And they go, well, what do we do? What do we do? And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God sent his son 2,000 years ago to die because of how much he loved you, to pay for your sin and to get you back in relationship with him. And that relationship comes with a gift called the Holy Spirit. And I want to make it available to you today. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna to talk to those of you who came into the room today and maybe you didn't know God, you weren't a Christian, you weren't walking with Jesus, but today you're going, I want it, I need it. If that's you, just pray this prayer. Jesus, I need you. No, you died on the cross for my sin. I believe it today like I've never believed it before. I believe you rose again from the dead and I want you to raise my life too. If you prayed that prayer just as a bold demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power at work within you. I just want, on the count of three, I want to invite you to raise your hand. It's a sign that you are surrendering to God's work in your life. You're receiving the power that's available to you today. One, two, three. Yeah, praise God. Praise God. And amen. And amen. Amen. Hey, can we celebrate hands all over the room who are saying, I want the power of God today? Eyes closed again for just a second. Now maybe you're here today and you, you're a Christian. No, you're going to heaven. You, you've taken care of that before, but you would say, I need a fresh move of the spirit of God today. My faith has gotten a little cold. It's gotten a little stale. It's gotten a little dry. And I need a fresh move, a fresh filling of the spirit today. If that's you, I'm just gonna invite you to pray. Say, God, fill me again. Make me desperate. Fill me again. If you prayed that prayer, on the count of three, would you just raise your hand so that we can know that God is filling people fresh again? One, two, three. Come on, all over the room, all over the room. Jesus, we love you. You are so worthy of glory and of honor and praise. Fill us again. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.